Hi, I'm Reverend Dave Forsberg, pastor at Imlay City First Congregational United Church of Christ. Again, welcome to our meditation on the word and of prayer and of scripture today. Let's begin our time together this morning. It's the sixth Sunday after Easter with this prayer. Please pray with me. God of wonder and glory, this world around us is awesome. You created it. You continue to hold it together, even as we sometimes threaten to tear it apart. God of justice and righteousness, to you we look for the truth. God of grace and mercy, the love you have shown us in Jesus is more than we deserve. We come to you now, thirsting for your living water. Guide us to the streams of your wonder and glory. This we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to read now some passages from Psalm 16. And what I'd like you to do is when I prompt you to repeat after me. I'll say, and the people say, and then you will say those words. Protect me, O God. For you I take refuge in, and the people say, You are my Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. God holds our lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, and I have a goodly heritage. And the people say, I bless the Lord who counsels me. It's the Lord who counsels me. I keep the Lord always before me because God is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. And the people say, My heart is glad, my soul rejoices. It's glad, my soul rejoices. God, you show us the path to unity. And let the people say, In your presence there is fullness and joy. Fullness there is presence and joy. Let us pray. God, we have all sinned and fallen short according to your teachings. Let us make now in our confession the cry for you to help us, to be with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, for the times that we measure our happiness by the number and price of our possessions. Have mercy on us. For the days when we measure our faith by the number of people who speak well of us, let us say together, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, we thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who uncovers our foolishness, exposes our self-deceits, and offers us an overflowing cup of saving grace. Friends, this morning we're going to look at a scripture passage that uh, I think contains some familiar words. Many of you have heard many times. We're reading this morning from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. Hear now these words from the Apostle Paul. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but, knew, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures 
all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophecy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. Those are the words from the Apostle to the Gentiles, the Apostle Paul. A wonderful reading and great words. Wonderful words. When I think of those words, I think about weddings. I've done a few weddings in my times in terms of officiating, and no doubt you've been in some weddings, you've witnessed some weddings, you've planned your own wedding. The Apostle Paul, though, I think this morning as we look at what he said in 1 Corinthians, I don't think he ever imagined in his wildest dreams that those words that we just heard would be used thousands of years later in weddings. Yeah, in weddings. Yep. Marriage ceremonies. When we think of marriage ceremonies, I think it's safe to say that those words that we just heard, of faith, and hope, and love, they've been used in a fair amount of wedding ceremonies. Paul, if you recall, has been fostering the formations, formation of churches, I should say. He's visited towns, He's gone to synagogues and preached. He's visited with people who have become followers of Jesus Christ. And they've now set up house churches. House churches is exactly the way it sounds. People got together. And without using the word churches, simply got together in the homes of people to meet and to worship God and to worship Jesus Christ. Usually these house churches that Paul wrote to he wrote to this morning in 1 Corinthians 2. Usually numbered in terms of uh, members, about 10 to 15, although in larger churches, scholars say that the attendance could have been as high as 50 people. If you joined us last Sunday, you learned that Paul would not only go into cities and form churches with the help of people, but then he would later on go and write to them. And usually when he wrote to churches, it was because he heard about a problem going on in those churches. And in the first paragraphs of his letter to the Corinthians, Paul addressed a situation that we spoke about last week, in which there were some members of the congregation that were following people within the church for a variety of reasons. Maybe they gave a good sermon. Maybe they were very charismatic. They had great leadership qualities. In other words, people were aligning themselves into different factions within the early Corinthian church. The membership of the Corinthian church that Paul writes to and that you heard about this morning in our lesson, the membership was very diverse. We had married and unmarried people. We had freed slaves. We had former people who practiced the Jewish faith. We had former synagogue leaders, all in this diverse membership that made up the Corinthian church. And Paul, as he always does when he writes about the need to address conflict, he tells people, keep an eye on the cross. It's the cross that matters for what it stands for and the message that is behind the cross, the teachings of Christ. Today, Paul tackles a different problem, a different division that's going on in the Corinthian church. Now it seemed that there were people in the church that had been going around within the church and boasting about themselves, that they had, compared to others in the church, 
wonderful gifts from God. They could speak in tongues. They could be able to prophesy about what is going to happen. They kind of went around thinking they were, sounds like, better than other people because they had unique gifts compared to others in the church. And Paul likened their boasting to banging on a gong, banging on a cymbal. This was a community that Paul surmised that was fragmenting and rapidly, rapidly becoming a church of big divisions. In response, Paul gives an awesome, wonderful letter today on so many levels that reverberates, I think, today for us. I kind of likened his response that he gives this morning to like the situation in which we oftentimes will go to the water, throw a pebble into a calm lake, and watch the ripples just kind of telegraph and go and go and go and go and go and go. That's what his response is this morning for us. Paul's words that he gives were in a pastoral tone kind of a way. He was playing the, the message. He was trying to employ in a very nice and respectful and pastoral tone a solution to these people that were going around saying they had unique gifts and perhaps maybe they saw themselves as better than the others. So he gently and he brilliantly unveils a qualifier. He says this, what good are your spiritual gifts if they are not used and given to others in love, in love? What good is it? How can you build up the church if you're not using your God-given talents in a spirit of love? He says to the people in the Corinthian church, yes, use your God-given talents. Help people around you. But do it on the basis of love. So Paul takes one of the bedrock teachings of Jesus Christ, loving one another, and says, use that power, that power of love. In other words, do with the spirit of love. You remember Jesus said, love one another, love one another. That is the bedrock that Paul uses this morning in imploring people to use their talents, use their talents with love. Love is the way, the method in which Paul says, practice our gifts, use our spiritual gifts. Love is the inspiration the means, the goal of life, as so eloquently stated by Norman Wurzba, who is a professor at the Duke University Divinity School. Wurzba has also said that love is the heart that pumps whatever genuine Christian life, and faith, and practice that can be possible in any congregation. He says that Jesus... Jesus' original version of the church was for it to be a training camp for love. Paul also talks today about the qualities of love as it pertains to the church. One of the four words in Greek for the word love is agape. Agape. Perhaps you've heard that word before. Agape is self-emptying love, self-giving love, all-encompassing love. It is, as I am reminded, the kind of love that God has for creation and for us. God's love for us is agape love. And it's that agape love that Paul is talking about. It's the kind of love embodied in God's love for humanity and in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the case of this very, as I said before, very personal and pastoral letter by Paul, this apostle says that love, it's not a feeling in this case that he's talking about, but it's an action, not a feeling, but an action that is done for the good, not for oneself, but for others. 
Love is a call to guide our smallest and our largest actions. And it's the kind of love that Paul says eclipses, goes above and beyond faith and hope. He says that this kind of love is patient and kind. Paul talks about a love that is not romantic and warm and powerful, intense and fuzzy, but a deep, consistent, honest, always present, abiding love. And a, a love we must have for people. Paul names this character of love for us. He also tells us that this character of love is also the embodiment of the church. And that by having love as the embodiment of the church, we can go and we can operate our churches and be with people and be able to turn away by not being so impatient, being so irritable when someone says something or done so or does something that goes against our way of thinking. Love empowers us to be patient and kind with people around us. There's nothing sentimental about Paul's concept of love here this morning. It's the kind of love that is active and tough and resilient and long-suffering. That's what love, that's the kind of love that Paul is talking about. So Paul not only gives us the driving force behind our faith and the heart that pumps our churches, Corinthians today, he also gives us an opportunity to look within ourselves. Look within ourselves and see if there's any room for improvement in terms of how we deploy our love, our gift of love for people. He gives us a chance to look back at our lives, what we've done to date, through the eyeglasses, if you will, the lenses of love. And know that if we go and look at our accomplishments and see that we have attained our milestones in love, in life, that is, with love, that is the important part above all, the most important part. Paul, by using his definition of love this morning, says if we use love to reach our goals, reach our accomplishments, they are indeed grand ones because they were done under the warm glow of love. Paul essentially says this morning, friends, that we should take the long view in life. What matters the most, Paul said, is that at the end of our lives, on this side of life, it's not what we achieve not what we achieve, but what we give in love. Love is the one thing that lasts forever and will long after we leave this earth for the next life. It's the love that we give away, be it for our spouse, our family, our friends or strangers that cross our paths. A love of doing a love of helping. That's the essence of love for Paul today. And that's the essence of our life. Love. Love. We heard today, too, from Paul, about faith inspired through the Holy Spirit. We heard about hope that comes from the resurrection and a hope that we especially look to now in these times of COVID-19. I think that's important to think about. Paul talked about love, the love that we get in and through Jesus Christ. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. A passage? Some words for a wedding? Yes. Okay. A passage to guide our church 
all churches and to inform us what Christian faith is all about and what life is all about? Yes. In Corinthians this morning, Paul gives us the root of the Christian faith and our life. Love. Amen. Please pray with me. God, you are one of new possibilities. We give you thanks for our constant reminder that we hear from you and see in you, that you have a vision for our world that far exceeds our present realities. You call us out for cynicism, call us out for our apathy, our fear. You ask us to keep our eyes on the life that you would have us live. We are grateful, God, for the courage and determination you make available to us to sustain our efforts, to work for better relationships, justice, and peace, to help us find the language and the courage to share our own faith stories with each other, and to be open and honest and humble in all of our interactions. God, we pray for our world and those nations where violence and tyranny cause so much suffering. We pray for people driven out of their homes and their homelands this morning, people who struggle to survive in refugee camps. We pray for those who do not have enough food to sustain them or water to quench their thirst. We pray for those who are victims of slavery, even in this 21st century. God, we feel so helpless at times. Help us to enact your commands to love and to feed your sheep. For those who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit, God, we ask for your healing and peace and presence with them. Be our light in these COVID-19 times, O God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now, God, we say to you together, either silently or out loud, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Let us say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Friends, this morning, let me leave you with this benediction. God sends us into the world to accept the costs and the joy of discipleship, to love one another. So please go today. Go and do. Embody love. Help people. Share the peace of Christ with others and the love of God and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. Go now, my friends, in love. Thank you again for being with us here at Imlay City First Congregational United Church of Christ. I'm Reverend Dave Forsberg. Please join us again next Sunday at 1.30 for more meditation and prayer in the Word. Till then, take care and God bless.